Hi, and welcome to Future Ready Storage Insights. I am your host today, Daniel Newman. And if you aren't familiar with me, I am the co-CEO and founder of V3 Broad Suite. I'm also part of the Dell Insight Partner Programs, and I'm excited today to be talking about Future Ready Storage Insights with two of my fellow Dell Insight Partners. Uh, before, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome, for those of you that haven't been sitting in the room for a while, Eric Vandenberg. Eric literally wrote the book on storage, and he's also the Director of Information Services and Security at Jurnov. Kevin Jackson, another author with another a new book coming out this year. Very exciting, Kevin. You'll have to tell us more about that. And he's the founder and and one second, I'll get you because I want to hear about it. <laughs> he's the founder and CEO of GovCloud Network. Kevin, tell us about this book you have coming out. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I'm excited to be here. So uh, in uh, late May, early June, uh, my book is focused on cloud and different industries, cloud security. So it's a it's entitled uh, cybersecurity, a industry view point. And it talks about not just general security, but specifics with respect to each of the industry verticals. Because as you apply this new business model, you really have to think differently about all aspects of the technology. And cybersecurity is one of the key aspects. So I'm excited about That's it. That's fantastic. Yeah, Kevin, that's amazing. As a guy who I'm actually in the process, I've uh, written four, and my fifth is coming out. Every every time a book comes out, that's extremely exciting. So two authors, two respected technology member, uh, members of the tech community, and two fellows who have attended uh, Dell World along with me in the past and know the Dell offering uh, very well, are excited uh, to have you guys here to help enhance the IT knowledge of the audience and the crowd and to have a great co uh, conversation. So just for everybody out there, we're also running this in parallel on Twitter using the hashtag IT storage. Um, so guys, welcome to the show. Are you ready to start answering? Because I'm going to start uh, firing some questions away. And just so everybody out there does know, uh, Dell's own Jeremy Parker will be using uh, a hash, uh, the Twitter handle at jpatdell, and he will be sharing some questions, and Dell's Bob Fine will also be out in the Twitter community asking questions. So you will be able to get us either here uh, by a asking questions. You can ask them right in the live chat. Just hit slash Q, and I'll make sure to try to ask the questions of Eric and Kevin, or also throw the questions over on Twitter, and they will either try to catch up and keep up with them in real time, or if not, I'm sure they'd be happy to go back and look at those questions later. These two guys are both terrific Twitterers. Um, I see them out there all the time, not only promoting, but having conversations. So, Eric, I'm going to start off with you. First question, what are some mistakes uh, that companies are making when selecting and implementing a storage solution? Well, I would say, uh, first off, that some of the companies don't understand the near-term and uh, long-term goal differences. They plan more for the near term. I'm getting an echo on here, by the way. But we'll try not to let it bother me, I guess. Oh. Um, uh, so they plan for the near term, they, basically what they need right now. And then they find out that they can't uh, scale later on. Uh, some other companies design their solution for a specific workload and then find out that they uh, need to change as, as the environmental uh, factors change or as they decide to get into a different type of business, uh, open up a new, new venture, and uh, their storage solution isn't adaptable enough to uh, be able to take on the new role. Uh, also, a lot of companies don't fully understand the total cost of ownership of the equipment the power and cooling and the maintenance that goes into uh, maintaining that system over the long term. Yeah, no, those are, that's a number of great points. And I know you're, you're trying to overcome a little echo on your end, Eric, but yeah. I think you bring up some great points, which makes me want to throw a question over to Kevin's way about, you know, new, new business models. So business models are changing greatly, especially when it comes to IT consumption. So how are these newer business models affecting the storage architectures that enterprises are deploying today? So it's a great question because in today's world, 
a business is instantly global and you have to operate in an environment that changes very quickly. And today, a business can change their business model, even change their product and service in hours. And they use data to actually drive that change. And the use of data and the storage infrastructures are really have become key to differentiation in the marketplace. And all of the data sources, things like real-time data from social media and data uh, and uh, Twitter, or your, um, your customer data, what they have bought, when they have bought, what they have actually looked at before, before they bought from you, all of that enables you to differentiate your product or service from your competitors. So the storage architecture not only has to be agile, but it has to be large and it has to be linked to multiple sources. And companies don't realize the scope and the importance of storage in their business model. I think that's a great point. Eric, do you see any other impacts that the shifting models, because I like Kevin's points about the data a lot and the way companies have to store, access additional data for both their, you know, uh, I would say predictive and prescriptive data strategies. Um, but what else? Are you seeing any other impacts of storage because of new business models? Well, sure. We, we see the consumerization of IT and uh, that results in a, a lot more devices that are on not both on, both on the network, but connecting into enterprise applications. And the uh, the business has adapted to be able to use these devices and to allow uh, employees to access them from all over the place. You know, uh, they're combining cloud technologies with um, local data stores, but then needing to back up and integrate all those systems together. So, uh, you know, the, the model of allowing that and um, it also results in additional challenges. We also see companies that are basically offering data as a service, uh, mining the data for you and um, then offering you the insights based on it or selling you data um, that they've collected. Uh, quite a few you know, large companies we see like Facebook and others that, that of course, are, are selling you the data they've collected from, from their users. Yeah, I think uh, you brought up a, a very important part um, aspect of social media and how it's really merging with what we used to see as our business life. There is no difference. In fact, I know companies that issue LinkedIn personas to their employees so that they can help in the uh, sales process. And, uh, and in that way, the company actually owns the data about the individual's, quote, work life. So this whole this is a whole new world of blending your work with social media and companies being able to do that not only e efficiently and effectively, but legally. <laughs> and these and uh, the laws about data um really has not kept up with the technology so when you're talking about like these future storage architectures you have to build into your business the processes that understand where the data is and who can have access to the data well, Kevin, I, I really like that. And I've got a, a lot of additional questions that I want to ask you guys during this hour. But I do have one slightly further question I want to ask about what you just mentioned about social. Where are we at with getting some of these social data, the implications of all this social data into the enterprise storage strategy? Are companies planning for this? Is there any good guidance out there that they can can gravitate to to help them 
plan ahead? Because you said they're behind, but I can't imagine they're going to be behind for very long. So unfortunately, the answer is that they will probably always be behind. And the IT professional is going to have to um, sort of guide the organization in a, in a, a, a best guest effort based upon their knowledge and experience. Think about it. Just uh, a few months ago, the whole safe harbor agreement between the EU and the United States got blown up after being very useful for actually driving electronic commerce for almost 20 years. And they have just now sort of reinstated it the the aspects of uh, medical care, the data driven uh, medical care that's gone throughout the world. How do you manage or track that type of information when the laws around the exchange of medical data are? So Kevin, I, I don't know if I if I lost you there for a second, but I want to jump into a question that uh, J. Pat Dell is asking out there. Um, and Eric, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw this one over your way. Um, what is the store hybrid storage array and how do they fit in an enterprise storage strategy? So that the simplest description of a hybrid storage array would be one that uh, combines both flash-based storage and spinning disks together uh, to provide a solution that gives you uh, some of the advantages of flash uh, with high IOPS, uh, IO per second, and uh, then the capacity of uh, your spinning disk. Now, how does this fit into the enterprise? Well, it could fit in with you know new acquisitions of storage, uh, where you deploy a hybrid solution to uh, gain that uh, high speed storage, but also at a lower cost, and also could be used to extend existing solutions, uh, either adding flash on and uh, virtualizing the existing system or adding flash onto another system for a cache and, and other um, uh, methods of, of speeding up the initial access to the storage. What do you think, Kevin? Is there is there anything else in terms of the the hybrid storage array that uh, you know enterprises should be thinking of? I think hybrid's kind of a, a hot topic right now in general, uh, and most people are probably thinking about them primarily in the sense of of cloud. But you know, in the, on the storage side, are you seeing any other ways that hybrid's fitting into the enterprise model? Yeah, absolutely. Because of the uh, expansive requirements for data you always have to have a balance between very expensive, very agile, very uh, fast flash storage and slower, maybe not as fast uh, spinning disk. Um, so those two tiers will always be driven by economics. But in order to manage the agile nature of business, this third tier, between those two tiers is becoming more and more important. That's absolutely right, which kind of leads us into the next question, Kevin, I'd like you to kick off for us too, is you know, how much of the enterprise data today is being kept in primary storage versus you know, that that's being kept as, as secondary? Right, that's a very uh, interesting trend. Um, there have been a few studies, one by IDC, I believe, that said that less than 20% of an enterprise's data is actually kept in primary storage. That says 80% is in secondary storage. So first of all, most of your storage is going to be in secondary, and you need that, that data in order to understand what has happened so that you can actually um, serve, service your customers better. So that 20% needs to be fast, but that 80%, although it's in secondary, it needs to be accessible. Do, do you think, uh, Eric, that accessible and fast need to go together? I mean, I guess nowadays my thinking is, does the user of the data really care 
whether it's primary or secondary, but rather, as Kevin just said, that it's accessible. But if it's in secondary storage, is there any real leeway anymore for secondary storage to be slower from an accessibility standpoint, or should all data really be equally accessible when it comes to speed? Well, I, I think you've kind of hit on it right there. The users, <laughs> yeah, <oops. laughs> yeah, the, the, the users, yeah, you got a leading question, right? <laughs> but yes. the, uh, the users really have no tolerance for uh, an application that's slow. Uh, now, unfortunately, if it's a line of business app that they have to use, they're, they're going to suffer through it. But with a lot of complaints and uh, maybe excuses when, when they don't use it properly, and it's going to result in uh, less productivity for sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't see a, a big difference. Kevin, it sounds like you wanted to chime in. Yeah, one of the things that is becoming more and more important are multi-channel and multi-modal communications with your clients and customers. That also means the data itself has to be consumed and delivered through differing technologies because you're using different devices, different technologies, different infrastructures. And that puts even more uh, strain and stress on your storage infrastructure. Yeah, absolutely. So we got a, an audience question that just popped in from uh, Nathan Weaver. He asked, uh, you know, with the move to in-memory database technologies, you know, do you think most, if not all, storage will soon become secondary? And Kevin, I'll let you answer this because you had the stat that only 20% was primary. Do you see that number going down even further? So I don't know if it will. I expect it to be about the same uh, because the, um, the interaction, interactive support, interactive interactions with customers need to be done in near real time. And that can only be done in and out of primary storage. So there you go, Nathan. That's the take. Uh, Eric, do you see the same thing? Yeah. You know, Nathan, uh, just ask anybody who's uh, run out of their uh, in-memory storage whether or not it's uh, important still to have that, uh, that primary, secondary storage that's uh, accessible and fast and they'll tell you oh yeah it is because as soon as you run out you you got to be flushing back to that disk somewhere or you're going to lose the data and in between that of course there should be a, a continual io process that is sending you know something back so that if you have a, a crash system uh crash cluster that the data uh is still on a storage media that can can be restored Another important point is just look at the marketplace. SAP's biggest splash over the past year has been HANA, and that's their entire database in memory. So do you call that primary or secondary storage? And I think that was kind of his question, you know, because you talked about the move to mm -hmm. memory database technology. So, um, and that's why he said, you know, does most uh, data... Mm -hmm. you know, basis and data become secondary. So kind of an interesting question and something to keep our eyes on. But I want to jump forward into a question that I think most people in the business are always asking, right? When you're a technology decision maker, you're saying, hey, I want to make the right choices. And, you know, it's good to have experts like yourselves to lean on when they say, what are some of the mistakes that companies are, uh, you know, making when they're selecting and then implementing? And maybe Kevin... Um, you can talk about implementation, but uh, Eric, why don't you start off and talk a little bit about the mistakes that they're making when they're selecting storage? So I think we talked about a few of them earlier. You know, they're where they're not they're not right sizing it. They're they're choosing one that doesn't quite fit their current environment. Where they're uh, choosing one that's uh, not going to adapt with them as their company grows and changes. Uh, also, where they're uh, they choose one that's it costs more for them to maintain over the long term. Uh, sometimes they uh, um, it has an inability to support their uh, uh, the application tools that they adopt down the road. Now you think of uh, cloud services. You know, if there's a uh, an application or storage system that is unable to adapt to uh, services like that or to work in in a uh, a hybrid 
cloud type of a situation or to work with external applications, then uh, it, it's basically siloed and you're going to have to develop something else side by side. So Eric talked a little yeah. bit about this selection process, but Kevin, obviously a lot of times where things fall on their face is the implementation. People select what probably is the right solution or at least could be the right solution based on the criteria, but then implementation is a, is a huge fail point. So what are some of the mistakes companies are making when it comes to the implementation and what are some recommendations you have for them to fix those mistakes? Yeah, so the, the first mistake is to believe that implementation has an endpoint. In today's world, you are continually modifying your infrastructure. You're changing it constantly. So if you, if you are still living in that world where you create a vision of an infrastructure, you set aside a budget, then you implement it, expecting it to last for the next two or three years, you are woefully mistaken because as soon as you decide to do something, there will be a new technology, a new capability, or even a new business model that will be better and faster and more agile than you just implemented. So continuous change is the first thing you have to accept when it comes to implementation. Second, the tight linkage between the implementation and the business model. We are talking about new storage paradigms because of changes in business models. Big data, the enterprise applications, the change and transition to containers and microservices and social networking. So all of these things make implementation a continuous change. That's it's a great point, Kevin. I think uh, agility is a word that could continuously come up. And, and I'm glad that you mentioned that because there is no way that anything we basically buy today is going to be the newest and most relevant tomorrow. So you hit on something interesting. And, and you know, I'd like to make sure that you guys keep that in your answers thematically as we move forward is dealing with agility, dealing with the fact that things are not the same and will not remain the same for very long. So when you do make decisions or you are, you guys are providing out you know, advice here, change does happen so fast and so regularly. Part of yeah, uh, the I other guess that thing, future ready strategy. One thing I like to say, you talk about future ready strategy, but enterprises uh, have moved into an hybrid environment. And that, that not only means hybrid technology, but that means hybrid management. You will have control of some of your infrastructure, but you will be consuming IT from uh, cloud service providers and outsourced providers where you have less control. So this is part of agility as well, being able to use a service or use an organic capability and to make that management choice. Absolutely. So I want to go on to something that's uh, pretty important to most decision makers in the IT space, and that's operational costs. So we're seeing a lot of the shifts with data center investment going from you know the old CapEx to OpEx. That's been a hot topic for some time now. But with the growth of storage, the rapid you know, growth of data and the need to collect data, what are we seeing in terms of the effect on data center uh, operational costs? And Eric, I'll let you take this one. Sure. Well, one thing to point out is that you know, the initial purchase price of a storage solution is uh, typically only about 20% of the three-year uh, operational cost. At least that is for... Uh, the uh, traditional um, the spinning disk type solutions. Now f we're seeing a little bit uh, better numbers with flash arrays with lower operational cost, uh, where it may be in some cases as high as uh, fifty percent of that um, due to low power, lower power consumption, better utilization of the disks, where you know you may have had to carve up uh, very large RAID groups in order to meet the IOPS requirements of applications. And those would go largely underutilized. Uh, you also get uh, better uh, 
better cooling because it's producing less heat and uh, in some cases easier management because you have fewer raid groups and fewer um, disc groups of, or uh, pools in order to uh, uh, manage your, your systems and less provisioning of all those. Those are some great points there, Kevin. Are you seeing any uh, any impact, you know, with your clients, customers, and you know, people you're communicating to in terms of, you know, their their operational costs as related to their data center expense with the with the rapid data proliferation? Yeah, one of the big challenges that we're that the organizations I've worked with see is that they have different technologies that also have different um, management interfaces and and different APIs and they put a lot, they wind up putting a lot of effort into these different systems being able to talk and work with each other and then it becomes fragile because it's a one of and then it costs more money to keep it up to date and to improve it as the technology changes so as we go into this environment where you have multiple tiers of storage, it's even more critical to have a consistent management interface with these different storage tiers so that you can make choices with respect to how the data is being used and keep up with the pace of your business model. It also can avoid the um, things like um, being locked in to a cloud service provider uh, because you're going to have a, a hybrid IT environment. APIs are important, and you need to have these APIs across all three tiers of your storage architecture, but you need to have a single management interface. So with all this in mind, you know, we're basically seeing things starting to evolve here you guys are getting a better handle on the costs for for companies with the with the growth of data you know, we've talked about some compliance issues i want to talk a little bit about flash storage so you know spinning disks are still the way of a lot of data centers you know in terms of the storage applications companies are still mm -hmm. using them you guys have actually used that uh, term a few times throughout this conversation here but with the rapid growth of flash storage and the expectations of immediate accessibility are the spinning disks going to be around much longer? How, what do you see that, you know, in terms of the future? Um, Eric, do you see spinning disks having a, a short shelf life or are they still going to have their place because of their, the volume of which they can, they can store for companies? Well, I think, uh, first off, at least over the next three to four years, you're going to see those who are uh, still in refresh intervals uh, who have, are waiting for that interval to come up. Uh, they'll still be retaining those spinning disks. Uh, I also see uh, those that are replaced with flash or higher speed storage that will um, be used for other purposes. You know, there's potential to use them for uh, development or testing environments. Uh, now, naturally, if you're using slower speed uh, disks in your development and you have some sort of expectation of performance in production, you're are going to need to test that elsewhere in order to uh, gauge its performance level. But uh, they can be used there also uh, sometimes in cold sites or even at uh, remote replication endpoints. Uh, so I can see that you know, being moved around to these other locations, um, but for new installations, uh, Flash is just, it, it's, uh, it has a, a lower price per gig uh, than your 15K SAS drives, um, at least when you're comparing against like the uh, the TLC flash. So there's a place for fa flash in every single uh, workload and implementation there. And I see it uh, only growing and replacing a lot of the spinning disks that are out there. Which takes me to a yeah, question I, for you, Kevin. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. No, I was just saying yeah, ahead, that, um, yeah, I was just saying that there will there this is a we will always be in continuous transition and as long as we're in transition there will be a use for uh spinning disk hello daniel are you still there i can i can hear you kevin 
Okay. Yeah, I hear you, Kevin. Sorry, I it, it you did chop out a little bit there, but but I can hear you now. So, I wanted to jump into something about you know you mentioned both of you about how much data is growing, the amount of data that companies are accountable for managing and keeping track of, and having high performance accessibility on every bit of that data may or may not be realistic. So what are you guys seeing for modern storage solutions that allow both high density you know, to manage all the storage that is needed, but also high performance to create that user experience for those that are seeking to access the data? Are the storage solutions there yet? So um, absolutely, they're coming into the marketplace, um, but it, it, it takes time for enterprises to understand how to fold these new solutions into their infrastructure. Um, the thing that's key is understanding the data progression strategies that you need. And those data progression strategies are driven by the business model. I think some of the uh, solutions that Dell are bringing to the marketplace are actually scratching that itch because they are providing, you know, three tier architectures with consistent management software that can be tuned to match the business model. Yeah. I would follow up. I mean, that tiering is uh, very important. That's that would be the first thing I'd think of. Uh, now, I wouldn't say that the whole technology of tiering is is brand new, but we've continually been revi revising the, uh, the the methods for taking the data in, uh, optimizing you know the the reads and writes against the high speed storage, and determining which data is going to be brought back and forth between uh, the tiers in order to optimize those reads and writes. The, the other thing that's becoming really important is as you transition into more open architectures is the ability to encrypt your data both um, at rest um, and at in motion and even more importantly in use with um, homomorphic uh, encryption uh, technologies that are coming to, uh, to the marketplace. So we kind of hit on the, the storage challenges. We've talked a little bit about where the storage has gone, where it's going. We've, you know, going from high density and talking about flash, talking about accessibility. Security is another thing that's, you know, very, very important when it comes to making storage decisions, especially when you're moving things out to the data center or into hybrid environments. So what are some of the security challenges, Kevin, that companies are, are going to be facing in managing storage in the future? And then maybe what are some of the challenges they're facing right now today? Yeah, so I always say that the number one challenge that enterprises have with respect to their data is actually categorizing the data, knowing what type of data they have and understanding what type of laws or security controls they have to place on that data. In the past, there was a reflexive um, move to just saying all of the data is needs high security, um, and you because you controlled the infrastructure, you could make a business case to protect all of your data. Today, the agile nature of business and the cost of infrastructure in a, a global environment. And the the, um, the the capabilities that are being delivered by cloud providers, you no longer can make an economic case to protect all of your data at the same level. So this tiering of data, you also may have to tier the security that you put on this data. And that's a whole new strategy. You have to categorize your data, understand who it can use or access the data, and what devices the data should be accessed with or by, and even down to 
uh, geographic regions where you can access the data. So these are the challenges that will uh, be there for storage infrastructures. Absolutely. Now, Eric, you've got a, a, a little different situation being the head of I, IT and security for the company you're with, as well as doing the, you know, the writing and the authoring and the thought leadership. So what are some of the security challenges you're seeing and facing, you know, at Jiranov and within the role of running IT within an enterprise? Well, that one's yeah, pretty broad and of course extends past just uh, storage. So are you asking just about storage? Yeah, more, you know what? Let's, yeah, let's keep it on. Sorry. Yeah, let's keep it into the, into the man, you know, your security challenges within Jiranov in terms of managing your storage today and as you head into the future. Okay. Well, what Kevin had talked about, you know, in, in the categorization of data is one thing that we work with a lot of companies on. We call it a data inventory, and there are different automated tools that you can run, allowing you to create uh, key terms and a description of the data that's important, especially in compliance areas, uh, it, the data that describes, uh, say, a patient or a financial record, that you'll understand, well, where does that data exist? Because uh, it exists within files or within databases. And uh, and then you need to be able to track how does that data move around? Uh, and it, there's a specific challenges now that we uh, have data that flows you know, all over the place to, to uh, devices, both within and outside of the organization. Uh, we also have companies that are just moving a lot faster. Uh, the cloud services and uh, the uh, self-service portals allow uh, companies to deploy things quicker than they ever did before. But unfortunately, uh, when you have everybody deploying solutions, there may not be that same level of control or the evaluation of whether the, the solution meets your uh, security criteria. Uh, we have uh, we work with companies to uh, specify the, those the policies and, and procedures, of course, that will uh, guide their employees on how to uh, enact new technologies. And then, of course, there's the training and the auditing to uh, make sure that those uh, policies are, of course, being carried out. There's also, of course, the breach. We hear about that everywhere. You know, uh, when you have a variety of uh, different storage systems that are all working together, uh, you have the upstream and downstream providers that are all providing some service to the, the customer. Uh, if there is a breach at some level, there needs to be a level of information sharing, uh, notification, assessment, and uh, um, a communication so that you can effectively respond to the breach and uh, let customers know if if you need to. Right. There's no such so Eric, thing you know, as a, I was just saying, there's no such thing as a uh, totally secure infrastructure. So enterprises really need to understand how to respond to these uh, incidents because it's not if they will occur, it's when they occur. I, th I think you're absolutely right. You're starting to see more and more content out there and commercials out there for IT heads to kind of keep that in their mind that it's not, there's no such thing as perfect when it comes to security, but you're doing your darndest to try to stay ahead of those that are creating the, the biggest threats for you, which brings us to another thing that I think is really, really interesting. And I'd like to get both of your takes on this one and that's interoperability. So, Technology is changing fast and the, the refresh rates are changing faster and the needs for company to get back to old, uh, you know, get their new technology installed is very, very important. But at the same time, a lot of investment has been made in legacy equipment and a lot of that legacy equipment still has value and still has value to the to the enterprise. So can the newer storage technologies that you guys are, are re recommending and promoting and discussing out there, are they able to help companies continue to support their legacy applications and devices and storage uh, in installations while still modernizing? And I know we've touched on this, but I'd like to dig a little bit further into this one, Eric. So certainly when uh, you, you break down the process of, and the components of the application, uh, you can find certain pieces of it that can be upgraded. Uh, sometimes there needs to be some middleware or um, uh, you know, a, a connection between 
the old and the new uh, might re might require some customization. But uh, you can, first, you can you can break it up to upgrade the components that uh, are uh, easiest, and then there is also the possibility of virtualizing either the application or the the storage to make it um, speak the same language essentially as the the rest of the system. Now, if we talk about just general integration as well. Uh, once you deploy that integration across these technologies, both legacy and the new technologies, uh, it's important to make sure that you don't uh, essentially lock yourself into uh, some of the other technologies uh, by not using some of the open standards and uh, well-recognized uh, best practices. Yeah. Kevin, what do you think? So I too often see organizations that have hope as their strategy when they're transitioning uh, to new technologies. It's not a strategy. You must understand what you have, have a great inventory of the data, and then plan your transition in a way that can minimize um, any disruption in your infrastructure and maximize the value you still provide to your customers and clients. Uh, and I'm looking in the chat, uh, Dan, at uh, your cyber strategy pillars. Absolutely, I, I, uh, education is, is number one. You, you must go into any transition with open eyes, so being proactive and offensive, and buying insurance. The insurance is not just going to an insurance company. The insurance can be educating your IT team. <laughs> oh, it, it's funny, Kevin, that you say that, and I actually just responded to Chris, which I like those pillars, Chris, and thanks for jumping in and adding to the conversation. It sounds like you have a lot of expertise on your own. Uh, is that I think number three is sometimes underestimated as to how important it really is. And as you mentioned, I do think there's the insurance that comes through building uh, and training and educating your staff, but there's also the insurance that you need to buy because no matter how secure you think you are, one of the things that I'm sure keeps CIOs and, and leaders of IT departments up at night is, is as threats and the, the, the security threats. Uh, you know, we're winding down here for the last about five minutes, and I've got two more questions that I want to ask. And I'm going to kind of throw one at uh, you, Kevin, and one at Eric. Um, and if you have a minute on the last one, I'll have you both answer it. But so this last one for you, Kevin, at least this last one you're for sure getting today. <laughs> I want to know. How can storage systems enable companies to make better use of their data? So we touched on it, but help summarize that for the for the audience and those that have been listening. Storage systems, better use of data. Yeah, absolutely. So you touched on it earlier. The key word is agility. Being able to know your information and data, knowing what you have, tells you what you need. And the modern storage infrastructures that are tiered and that handle data progression with a consistent management interface gives you agility with respect to knowing and accessing your data. Now, Eric, because because uh, Kevin hit that one and got to the point real quickly, what do you think? I, I'd like to just touch on that a little further because use of data is probably more important than data itself, right? I think everybody would agree with that. Sure, so, that's exactly how you get value. Right, exactly. And it's, it's, it is that simple, but a lot of people talk about big data in the sense of volume. And I keep talking, I, I, I use the term little data all the time because most companies are just <laughs> extract a few small things from all this data and it can make a world of difference for them. How is storage impacting that? What do you recommend for people trying to get the most of their data through their storage implementations? Well, some just don't have the the infrastructure to be able to handle all of it. Uh, either they need to um, upgrade the infrastructure capabilities or utilize uh, external services to help mine that, or they need to 
call it down. I know, I know we don't want to talk about that, but uh, sometimes if you have a critical set of data you want to analyze, let's, let's ex exclude the data that you're, you don't want to look at in order to, to better focus. Uh, we're collecting so much data, we get bogged down in it and we can't find what we really need. Uh, so at the same time, while we're collecting, we're storing, we're putting it all in place, we, uh, we want to uh, prioritize. It's a, it's a, it's some great points there. So I don't know if any of you guys were either of you guys at Mobile World Congress. Um, no, I no, didn't make it. No. No. Okay. So I got to go this year and it's one of my favorite events, but there's a, there's a meme running around the internet and it's a picture of the entire uh, Congress, uh, the mastermind session with the huge audience and everybody's got their virtual reality goggles on <laughs> and Mark Zuckerberg is strolling down the aisle and everybody's heads are looking, you know, nobody even notices them there because their heads are all just immersed. So as we talk future ready, we have to talk a little bit about future technologies here. And two top future technology trends, one, virtual reality, two, Internet of Things, which I would say is not only a true, but a here today thing. Mm -hmm. So with those two things emerging, for instance, what are some of the biggest storage challenges that IoT, VR, AR, are going to be causing for, you know, companies dealing with uh, with their enterprise storage strategies into the future. And Eric, I promised you this one, so you get this one first. Okay. Well, you can see just with this uh, blab on the the bandwidth that was required in order to tra transmit back and forth. Of course, there's storage required to store all that video. Now, just think of VR and uh, how much more complex that is. We're talking about an awful lot of data that has to move very quickly from the, uh, the where it's stored to the end user. And so you're talking about an infrastructure that uh, is probably not what you have today. So there's going to need to be a, a lot of increases in both speed and capacity to be able to handle that kind of data. Now for IoT, we're seeing an explosion of the number of devices that are coming online. Now, purely from a security perspective, that's uh, the the hacker's dream because they can uh, basically exploit things like authentication methods uh, and uh, put devices on the network uh, that will either grab data or feed in garbage data to uh, disrupt these systems, right? Where see, even if you have a majority of good data and you get a little bit of bad data in there, it, it can wreck the whole system. And so uh, it's important then to uh, protect the data and screen the data that's, that's coming in from all these devices, authenticate them properly uh, as uh, we expand out and start utilizing IoT even more and in, to its potential. So Kevin, yeah. last thoughts, give me just a couple, one or two, uh, big challenges or small challenges that you see IoT and VR playing for storage before we close this hour up? So today I was going to work and I heard a commercial on the radio that General Motors was going to be introducing car to car communication in their 2017 line of vehicles. So imagine you're driving in your new 2017 vehicle and it's talking to the cars next door and you have an accident. Sorry you had an accident, but whose fault was it? Well, where is that data? Will it be at GM? Will it be at your insurance company who's collecting all the data so they can set your rates? Um, and what about three months from now when the person that you hit or hit you takes you to court? Will you now be able to subpoena the data from the Internet of Things of your car so that they can do a VR presentation of the accident to prove that you were wrong? That's what data is about. That's the storage. That's what your storage infrastructure may need to support. Isn't it scary? Mm -hmm. Read the contract on your car. <laughs> <laughs> See if there's that indemnification clause. No, right. it's going to be very, very interesting <laughs> with all with all these devices talking and, and you know emitting data and what they're actually saying and who's collecting that data, who has access to that data. Because yeah, Kevin, you brought up a whole thing. It's not just going to be about uh, you know the one company that collects it. It's all those that who have access to it. It's 
you know, it's, it's going to create a whole new as a service market too, for all these companies that are collecting data that has use for multiple other companies, how they're going to be able to utilize it and sell it. Um, may may uh, have something to do why a lot of companies that have never built a car are coming into the automobile industry today. So guys, I think you did a terrific job, a couple little technology hiccups, but uh, we overcame and persevered. You answered about more than a dozen really, really good questions and challenging questions on this state of storage and where it's going and how businesses can benefit for it. So Eric, I'd like to thank you very much and, and let you know that we appreciate you coming on as an expert here on this panel. Um, Kevin, same to you. Appreciate you very much and wish you all the luck in the world with the new book. Uh, for this particular Future Ready Storage Blab, I want to thank everybody for attending. And I look forward to seeing you guys on another Dell Insight uh, Blab here in the near future. So have a great day, everybody, and thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you.